The trend now is to colonize Mars. But let's go further than that. I'm getting bored of Mars colonies. Imagine going far beyond that. Imagine growing past the outside of our solar system. We start leaving behind familiar planets, familiar moons, and you finally start entering a vast space filled with frozen treasures and cosmic wonders. Welcome to the Kuiper Belt, in a celestial playground like no other. And not only that, imagine colonizing it. What would life look like there? And would we be able to survive it? I personally think we would stop looking human due to all the changes that we will go through. But let's see what we would have to go through if we were to colonize that area. These humans never stop. Anyway, let's go. What is the Kuiper Belt? Now exactly what is the Kuiper Belt, you may ask? Imagine a giant donut-shaped object orbiting the sun. Instead of houses, the vast area is filled with ice objects ranging from dust to asteroids. It's like an ice cream parlor in the Milky Way with a variety of flavors to choose from. Let's talk about sweet things. Let's talk about these icy ingredients that come together to make this frozen stuff. Think of it as a refrigerator preserving the remnants of the early solar system. Here you'll find a cold mixture of water, methane, ammonia, and other frozen solids. It's like a giant snowflake between the stars. But what makes the Kuiper Belt so special? Well, we have a repository of clues about the origin of the universe. Imagine exploring the wreckage of the early solar system, searching for answers to questions like how the planets were formed, their composition, etc. It's like being a cosmologist creating the history of our universe of the puzzle together. Then hold on tight as you wander through this snowy wonderland. As we venture deeper into the Kuiper Belt, we encounter interesting residents. Say hello to dwarf planets Pluto, Eris, and Makemake. These divine beings have their own unique personalities and traits and are ready to show you around their cool realm. And let's not forget comets, those weird cosmic colonists that sometimes rock our neighborhood. They hail from the Kuiper Belt, and their icy hearts hold secrets from the far reaches of our solar system. It's like an interstellar walk. But beware, for the Kuiper Belt is not without its challenges. It's cold and remote, with temperatures that make even the coldest winter on Earth seem balmy. Greater distances mean that travel takes time and careful planning. It's like embarking on an amazing space adventure. So let's see what it will be like. But before moving on, don't forget to subscribe to our channel if you haven't already. Make sure to hit the notification bell so you don't miss out on our daily videos. Why colonize Kuiper? So why colonize the Kuiper Belt and risking going that far? Well, the Kuiper Belt extends 30 times further from the Sun than Earth. Although initially unattractive for migrants due to the extreme distance and low light levels, it offers several advantages. Its isolation reduces the risks associated with major disasters in the sun, making habitats in the Kuiper Belt more likely to survive. Furthermore, the large distance of the telescope in the Kuiper Belt allows accurate parallax measurements of stellar distances. One of the main reasons why the Kuiper Belt is so attractive to migrants is because of its many valuable resources. Kuiper Belt objects, KBOs, which are 50 times more massive than the asteroid belt, contain vast amounts of water, ammonia, silicate materials, iron, and other volatile elements. Nitrogen, an essential element that sustains and is essential for life, increased diversity, especially in the Kuiper Belt. Nitrogen is needed for gas synthesis, protein, DNA synthesis, plastics, and rocket propulsion. Well, we're unlucky because nitrogen is scarce in other celestial bodies such as the Moon, Mars, and asteroids. Earth has a large percentage of nitrogen, but it limits the cost and potential environment impact of launching nitrogen into space to make it impractical. Venus and the gas giants are rich in nitrogen. However, their high gravity and lack of resources make nitrogen extraction and export difficult. Outside of the Kuiper Belt, possible resources of nitrogen include Ceres and large moons like Titan or Callisto. The surface of Ceres shows signs as ammonia-bearing minerals, and for months the upper ocean can harbor ammonia deposits, 
Who would have thought? Problems. But the colonization doesn't only bear advantages, which, if you think about them, are not that advantageous. Obviously, it comes with its sets of problems and challenges. The problems of inhabiting the belt can be summarized in three main aspects. Let's take a look. Firstly, and most importantly, it receives very little solar radiation, ranging from one-fifth to one-tenth that of the Earth's. Most of the dwarf planets in the inner system, such as the planetary belt and the Jupiter Trojans, are in this low-light environment. What would happen then? Logically, when sunlight is low, it is sufficient for agricultural purposes, because there are no clouds in space or at night to attenuate sunlight. But fortunately, insulation can be easily provided on these asteroids. Other methods, such as using glass domes or parabolic containers, can be a solid light source for agricultural or residential purposes. However, if we don't get enough sunlight, our mood can change for the worse. We can become severely sad, and no, not the sad emotion, but a seasonal affective disorder. Without sunlight, the devil begins to seduce us. We start transforming into vampires, or werewolves if you prefer. And imagine if we develop an unquenchable thirst for garlic bread, lol. We start doing seances to summon the sun and start applying night screen. Our moods may be so grim that we begin our life stories and music, accompanied by background music and excessive use of black and white filters. And who knows, maybe we'll be the world's first beach lovers at night, hosting beach parties at night with glow-in-the-dark castles and rave-worthy bioluminescent jellyfish. So remember folks, sunshine is essential for vitamin D and keeping us sane unless you're trying to work as a lovely undead DJ at night. So let's not ignore it. The second issue is gravity. Most asteroids and dwarfs in the belt have low gravity, and some don't even have enough gravity to hold someone back. But this force of gravity can be dealt with by spin gravity, where a stationary drum rotating inside the object can produce gravity. It also makes it easier to move cargo, because less energy is needed to leave the planet's surface compared to Earth's gravity. The third main issue is the limited resources in the planetary belt. The entire belt, including the largest planet Ceres, is only about 3-4% to the mass of Earth's moon. Real Earth has thousands of times more raw material than the belt. Although the Kuiper belt may be 20-200 to 200 times denser than the asteroid belt, it still contains a fraction of Earth's material. Even so, it remains valuable for mining and colonial purposes as it contains large quantities of iron, carbon, water ice, ammonia, methane, and other elements essential to life and production. Before we move on to the possibilities of colonization, be sure to stay tuned afterwards if you haven't seen our earlier release, the controversial topic, why colonizing the solar system will remain only a dream. Possibilities As for colonization outside the Kuiper Belt, including exoplanets and scattered disks, there are three options that do not rely on cheap fusion. First, classical nuclear fission using uranium and thorium in the solar system. Nuclear fission is a process in which the nucleus of an atom is split into two or more smaller nuclei, releasing a large amount of energy. Uranium and thorium are naturally occurring radioactive elements that can undergo nuclear fission. They are used in nuclear power plants on Earth to generate electricity. This would involve setting up nuclear reactors on the colonies and use the energy generated by the nuclear reactors to power various functions such as maintaining life support systems and providing electricity for other equipment. Second, larger energy collectors can be used to transfer energy from closer to the sun, although it is difficult to focus the ships that far. And finally, there can be powered cables that have powered ships to reach these remote areas enabling them to travel relatively quickly over conventional runways. So to recap, despite challenges, the planetary belt and other outer regions of the solar system can technically be colonized. They will have to use limited sunlight, gravity, and resource solutions, and they can use additional energy to try to stay where they colonized. In conclusion, the Kuiper Belt offers a fascinating and unique opportunity for colonization with vast resources and valuable insights into the origins of the universe. While it presents its own set of challenges, such as limited sunlight and resources, these can be overcome with innovative solutions such as spin gravity and nuclear fission. And who knows, 
maybe one day we will have thriving Kuiper Belt colonies, hosting nighttime beach parties and discovering new pieces of the cosmic puzzle. But until then, we can continue to explore and marvel at the wonders of our universe from afar. Why colonizing the solar system will remain only a dream. I live on astronomy, and that's perhaps why people are surprised when I say I'm not an enthusiastic supporter of space colonization. I'm not at all. I just can't be. And I'm not just referring to exploring planetary systems of other stars, whose distances are and will forever be absolutely insurmountable, regardless of our technological capability. No, ladies and gentlemen, I'm also decidedly skeptical about the possibility of our species establishing bases or colonies on our home planets. Keep watching, I'll tell you why. I know, compared to the vastness of interstellar space, our own solar system seems, at first, almost comfortingly accessible. But when we begin to examine the prospects for colonization, things turn gloomy. Try to follow along. Why would we even think of setting foot on planets where we would have to live only in pressurized, air-conditioned environments? and where outside a hole in the suit would give us a minute or so of life. Usually, there are three goals that space conquest fanatics invoke to justify colonization. Scientific research, the search for and exploitation of new natural resources, the terraforming of a planet that can become a second Earth. The first point is the one I feel I agree with. Exploration understood as the search for life in the universe must be pursued at all times and it is still the least complex and dangerous aspect of our activity in space. Increasingly intelligent robotic probes will indeed be able to operate in our place, without us having to descend to the planets as conquering demons or as desperate settlers in search of new lands. The second point on the list, on the other hand, I consider completely incomprehensible. We here on Earth do not have a problem with raw materials but with overpopulation and political management of resources. Imagining a future where we will make the same mistakes by raiding asteroids and digging mines in dangerous, godforsaken places seems silly to me. Fortunately, this will never come to pass. There is indeed no convenience in digging materials millions of miles from home. The costs will be impractical, and those who will try will abandon the venture after a short time. There could only be affordability if the raw materials were produced and consumed locally, on a reclaimed planet where millions of settlers would work and live with their families. And here we fall back on the third point. Do you, in our solar system, know of a planet that could be adapted to a second Earth? Do you know a place where you could go to live or bring your family? I don't think so. I think you would instead move to an Antarctic base, or for example to the Gobi Desert. Am I wrong? Are you thinking about terraforming Mars, the least troublesome planet of all? Well, take it from me, it would cost so much that we'd be better off colonizing our own ocean floors instead, or turn all of Earth's deserts into gardens and orchards. So even the pretense of colonizing the solar system will be put aside after a few years, when we come to realize that the stars are too far away and that our neighbors are unlivable worlds. And from then on, we will devote ourselves only to the moon, here on our doorstep, which will serve as an outpost for our scientific research, and to low orbit to improve living conditions on Earth through orbital control of satellites and space stations. If, however, you are still unconvinced by what I have just told you, you will certainly benefit from being convinced. Mercury The closest planet to the Sun. Minimum distance from Earth, 91 million kilometers. Diameter of 4,880 kilometers. No atmosphere. Poor water ice reserves. Gravity, 38% of that of Earth. Surface temperature, minus 180 to 430 degrees Celsius. The local day lasts 88 Earth days. Hell on the diurnal side. And an icy desert on the night side. Dangerous proximity to the sun. Very difficult and expensive to get there with a rocket and descent to the surface. A planet with these characteristics is certainly not a prime candidate for colonization. However, there may be water ice reserves in its circumpolar regions. A possible base should and could only be built nearby. But for what purpose? On Mercury, any kind of human activity 
is possible. Colonization potential, 0 out of 10. My prediction, by 2033, an attempt will be made to lower a rover into the twilight zone of the North Pole. Some data will be collected, many articles will be written, and the small planet will then be judged hostile and unprofitable for mining exploitation. I believe that from 2040 onward, we will not even waste sending an orbital probe to Mercury anymore. Venus Minimum distance from Earth, 42 million kilometers. Diameter, 12,100 kilometers. Gravity, 90% of Earth's. The ground pressure of 92 atmospheres. Average surface temperature, 465 degrees Celsius. Greenhouse effect, volcanoes, no water. The atmosphere is poisonous, dominated by carbon dioxide. Length of day, 116 Earth days. If in terms of size and orbital parameters, Venus is defined as Earth's twin, then in terms of climate, it is a decidedly evil twin. The ambient temperature is higher than that required to melt lead. Atmosphere stifling, dense and poisonous. Pressure on the surface is comparable to what it would be at an ocean depth of 900 meters. Stuff for a submarine or sperm whales. Thick clouds eternally cover the sky making it yellow-orange during the day and hopelessly black at night. Not only to live there, but even to set foot on those inhospitable plains would be unthinkable. And certainly such a task is far beyond the technology available to us in the future. The raising for colonization is slightly higher than that of Mercury, but only because manned balloons could perhaps be flown in its atmosphere. Colonization potential, 1 out of 10. My prediction, although hellish, the Venusian environment will continue to present some very interesting aspects from a scientific point of view. Venus is a living planet, and this will earn the attention of planetologists and the sending of atmospheric probes and surface rovers. Certainly, however, it will never become the second Earth, nor will we ever plant bases there. The Moon Closest Body the average distance from Earth is 384,000 kilometers. Diameter, 3,400 kilometers. The atmosphere is absent. Gravity, 16.7% of Earth's. Surface temperature, minus 153 to 123 degrees Celsius. The local day lasts almost 30 of our days. No one doubts that the Moon will become humanity's first, and perhaps only, outpost outside the Earth. Of merits, it has several. It is very close to home, and communications flow with an almost imperceptible delay. We have already been there and know it quite well. It seems to be rich in raw materials, oxygen, water, and fuel, possibly useful for launching missions further afield. Thousands of square kilometers of solar panels could be deployed here, then deflected back to Earth. Powerful telescopes could be set up in the hidden hemisphere, as could large radio telescopes. Some bases could house technicians and scientists, and perhaps a few wealthy tourists. Very small communities of workers and visitors, in short, because even for the moon, I can't imagine anyone would choose to go and live there. Colonization potential, 5 out of 10. My prediction, within a decade or so, we will have a couple of bases around the South Pole. But the orbital station, the lunar gateway, will never be built. Problems will arise, including political ones, and when things start to get slow, the public will protest the high sky costs. Musk will defect and the moon will go the way of the ISS, a place where crews warily alternate with no real reason. More decades will have to pass with new technologies to make the moon an effective scientific outpost, but it will only be a matter of time. Mars. Minimum distance from Earth, 55 million kilometers. Diameter, 6,780 kilometers. Gravity, 38% that of the Earth. Surface temperature, minus 126 to plus 20 degrees Celsius. The atmosphere is rarefied and irrespirable, the main component being carbon dioxide. There are reserves of water and dry ice. The Martian day is virtually the same as Earth's. So are the seasons, differing only in that they are almost twice as long. They say it is the planet with the most Earth-like environmental conditions. 
and indeed in some areas, the temperature can reach the values of a warm spring of our own. But the very thin atmosphere and near zero pressure would still dictate the use of a full bodysuit for outdoor activities. There is also a lack of a magnetic field to block solar radiation harmful to our bodies. Mars is also very far away and can be reached only by journeys lasting several months. In addition, because of the particular configuration of Mars's and Earth's orbits, astronauts would have to wait at least a year on its surface before they could return home. It follows that they would have to carry supplies and equipment with them to survive, without being able to rely on anyone's help in case of trouble. Establishing the first bases, however, will require dozens and dozens of missions to get all the necessary materials there. But then, what to do with them? I can only conceive of an expedition of scientists eager to solve the problem of Martian life, but I absolutely don't see what purpose we would have to settle settler communities in the Martian deserts. What could a settler or a miner get from the surface of the Red Planet that he could not already find here on Earth in the Gobi Desert. What's more, with the possibility of living a normal life and breathing air at the top of his lungs? Colonization potential 3 out of 10. My prediction, we will be able to set foot on Mars within a decade or so, but with results that are more emotional than substantive. And even when the last hope of finding life on that planet is gone, people will become disinterested just as they are disinterested now in the Australian desert. Too distant and inconvenient to think of setting up a home there. Ceres The largest object in the main asteroid belt. The minimum distance from Earth is 265 million kilometers. Diameter, 940 kilometers. Gravity, 3% of Earth's. The atmosphere is absent. The average surface temperature of minus 106 degrees Celsius. According to the most optimistic predictions, the dwarf planet Ceres, along with all its smaller siblings, will soon become a kind of Klondike, where public and private space agencies will rush to make money in mining. Indeed, the asteroid belt is considered a treasure trove of valuable raw materials. Once again, however, it is worth pointing out that the great distance, the absence of an atmosphere, and the temperatures as low as minus 170 degrees Celsius will certainly not be a good calling card when trying to assemble the human labor force needed to open the first mines. And on balance, it will be seen that the expenses will far outweigh the profits, unless the mine materials are used on site. But mined by whom? With what? And to do what with? Colonization potential 0 out of 10. My prediction it will be perhaps 20 years before a digging probe is sent to some asteroid to prove that mining is a feasible and cost-effective venture. We'll bring home a couple of pounds of randomly gathered material, and then all dreams about Project Klondike will be tucked away in a drawer. Europa Fourth largest of Jupiter's moons Minimum distance from Earth of 630 million kilometers Diameter of 3,120 kilometers Gravity, 13% of Earth's. Average surface temperature, minus 240 degrees Celsius. Atmosphere, virtually absent. Despite all the hype around Mars, it is this moon of Jupiter, and not the red planet, that is the most suitable place to search for extraterrestrial life. On paper, plans for automated and manned missions are being developed. However, even robotic vehicles on Europa are still a dream and no one seriously thinks that a permanent base could be established there. Lack of atmosphere, nightmarish temperatures, and ice-only surface. To get to the supposed ocean of water below in search of life would require drilling tens of kilometers, or hoping to examine some material ejected by some geysers. If it is done, this will be a job for a robot, certainly not for a human crew. Colonization potential, 1 out of 10. My prediction, it will be at least 20 years before a robotic probe can descend on Europa. It will find no trace of life, and this will cause not only Europa, but also Io, Callisto, and Ganymede, the other large moons of Jupiter, to fall into oblivion. Titan Saturn's largest satellite Minimum distance from Earth of 1,280 million kilometers Diameter of 5,150 kilometers. 
gravity, 14% of Earth's, average temperature minus 180 degrees Celsius, the atmosphere of nitrogen and methane, ground atmospheric pressure 1.5 times Earth's. Despite the breathtaking distance and all other impediments, I feel like assigning a nice 2 out of 10 as a theoretical possibility of settling a very small human colony on Titan in the future. As a well-known astrobiologist in fact said, if you're flying to the edge of the solar system and you have to make an emergency landing, run to Titan. Titan is the only place where there is a heavy atmosphere like ours with nice clouds from which rains fall, a world where rivers flow and there are lakes and seas. This is all true, but also all false. Lakes and seas are of liquid methane and other hydrocarbons and not water. The atmosphere is still unbreathable. The Sun, Saturn, and the stars are perpetually obscured by haze. We have been to Titan before, though with the small Huygens probe, and the landscapes photographed during the descent do not differ much from ours. Colonization potential 2 out of 10. My prediction, Titan is an extraordinarily diverse world, a kind of amusement park for those doing scientific research. The Dragonfly mission has already been scheduled for 2027, with the 2034 arrival of a drone that will fly for miles looking for traces of life. No human, however, will ever touch its surface. Of that, I am sure. Pluto Dwarf planet in the Kuiper Belt Minimum distance from Earth 5,800 million kilometers, diameter 2,380 kilometers, gravity 6% of Earth's, the average temperature of minus 230 degrees Celsius, extremely rarefied methane atmosphere. Having lost its status as a planet in 2006, in 2015 Pluto was flown over by the New Horizons probe, which gave us an enormous amount of data and photographic footage. Here, too, we have an extraordinarily diverse and scientifically interesting surface, but no chance for human crews to descend on it. On Pluto, everything is beautiful, but everything is a problem, made worse by the enormous distance separating it from Earth. Colonization potential 0 out of 10. My prediction, we will definitely send more probes to Pluto, but only for research into its origin, which is still debated. Here's the situation. I don't claim to be right about everything, and maybe reviewing this video 50 years from now, someone will get the same laugh that we still get now reading about those who said men would never fly on an airplane. But I find that sometimes a little healthy realism can serve to better understand why certain hard stops in the realization of so many space dreams, dreams flaunted perhaps too lightly. What do you guys think? Let me know in the comments below. And be sure to watch our other videos through the YouTube end screens and playlists.